Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Children's Summer Library Program 2021 workshop. I'm Kayla Martin Gant, the Continuing Education Coordinator for the Mississippi Library Commission. I'll be adding some additional resources for you all at the end of this video, but first, I'd like to introduce you to the main presenter for this workshop, Jessica Johnson Williams. Hello, and welcome to 2021 Tales and Tales SLP Children's Workshop. My name is Jessica Johnson Williams. I am the Youth Specialist Librarian at Madison County Public Library. Let's get started. Getting to know me. I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education and a master's degree in management. I am a former youth service assistant and branch manager at Jackson Hines Library System. My current position is a youth specialist librarian at Madison County Library Systems. I am married with two beautiful daughters. I am a small business owner and member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. I love to read, write, sing, dance, and all things girly and fashion. What to expect from this workshop? Benefits of children's programming, effective library programming, structuring programs for young children, how to conduct craft time, why is creative play important? Why is active programming important? Books to add to your collection, reminders and final thoughts and resources. Six benefits of children's programming. To improve reading skills, increase desire to read, improve self-esteem, neutralize summer learning loss, improve comprehension, and improve memory. Is the summer reading program flexible? Can you work the summer reading program on your time frame, or are you tied to specific times of day? Does the program offer a variety of reading activities, including games, or is it just reading and answering questions? Is the program labor intensive? And will the programs be in-person, virtual, or both? These questions are very important and we should be mindful of these questions in order to properly plan our programs for summer reading. A question to ask yourself when looking for the best benefits of summer reading program. Are the five tenets of reading included? Phonomic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. So let's delve a little bit more into these five tenets of reading and get a little bit more um, information on each one. The first one is phonomic awareness. It includes the ability to separate a word into the sounds that make it up and blend single sounds into words. It also involves the ability to add, subtract, or substitute new sounds in words. Um, examples would be the word mat. It has three phonemes. There are 44 phonemes in the English language, including sounds represented by letter combinations such as TH. More information on phonics. It is the method of teaching people to read and write by correlating sounds with letters or groups of letters in an alphabetic writing system. Examples of phonics. When a child is taught sound for the letter T, P, A, and S, they can start to build up words like tap, taps, pat, pat, and set. Children are taught 42 letter sounds, which is a mix of alphabet sounds, one sound, one letter, and diagraphs, one sound, two letters such as S-H, T-H, A-I, and U-E. Using multi-sensory approach, each letter sound is introduced with fun action, stories, and songs. A lot, of, a lot of children are more interested in activities, something that is fun, such as different songs or activities. This is what creates 
their learning ability. This is what helps them to grasp different concepts. The next one is fluency. Fluency is the ability to read with speed, accuracy, and proper expression. In order to understand what they read, children must be able to read fluently, whether they are able to read aloud or silently. When reading aloud, fluent readers read in phrases and add intonation appropriately. And intonation is basically when your voice rises and falls um, depending on what you're reading and basically expression. Examples of fluency is being able to speak a different language. Um, you're fluent in English or you're fluent in Spanish or different things like that. The next one is comprehension. Comprehension is the action of capability of understanding something. Examples of comprehension is how well are you able um, to understand a difficult math problem. The next one is vocabulary. Its meaning is all the language and words either used or understood by a person or a group of people. Examples of vocabulary is all the words that a toddler understand. That's their vocabulary. The language used by doctors, that's the doctor's vocabulary. And a dancer's vocabulary of movement, that's that dancer's vocabulary. Effective library programming permits young children to touch, manipulate, create, and experiment. Everyone learns differently. Um, some children are hands-on learners. They want to touch what they're learning. That's the only way that they will be able to grasp the concept. Some people like to be in control and not necessarily in control as um, power, but being able to control their learning and how they learn. So they're manipulative learners. Um, you have some that like to create. They take different activities and create their own activity for better understanding. Then you have some people that like to experiment and they would take different concepts. Um, there may be two or three ways of learning something. They're the type who wanna try all different ways and figure out which is best for them. By combining active programming with passive programming, the unique development needs of both pre-readers and beginning readers can be met. A little more information about active programming and passive programming. Um, active programming, everyone plays an active role in the actual program, and everyone is interested in the specific outcome. And passive programming allows patrons to participate with minimal to no staff direction. And passive is basically um, you have coloring sheets put out for them to pick up. Um, grab and go kit where you create different activities. Everything is in that bag and they're able to pick it up and they can actually use it to create the project. Structuring programs for young children. Preparation is key. That is very important. It's always important to make sure that you prepare for any activity, anything that you are going to do is preparation is the key. When selecting games and songs, take care to choose them according to the age levels of children in attendance. Also, be mindful. Complex lyrics and rules will confuse young children, and games that foster physical aggression are less appropriate than games that rely on chance of look. How to conduct craft time. Do not force children to participate in activities if they are not interested. Try to keep your group small, whether online or in person, and focus on process art rather than product art, and make sure that you prepare ahead of time to avoid confusion and frustration. What is process art? Process art 
is art that is child directed, choice driven, and celebrates the experience of discovery. In process art, the final product is always unique and the focus lies in the creation of the work, not the outcome. So process art is basically an activity or craft um, that doesn't have much of instruction. Um, they do have instruction. However, everyone's project is different. Um, as a product art is structured and focused activity that aims to produce a particular outcome. So process art is basically everyone's project you're doing the same project. However, each individual project is different because they're, they're using their own imagination. They're using their own creativity. Whereas product art is specifically, you're following the instructions as written and everyone's assignment or project comes out pretty much the same. Create, make and take or grab and go craft kit to be offered between programs. Use recycled materials such as cardboard, scrap paper, foam trays, thread spools, and cereal boxes. These materials can be found at your home um, and more than likely at your library. If you don't have them at yours, I'm sure that you can borrow some from other libraries um, or you can send out emails and I'm sure everyone will pitch in and send you what they have. So now it's time for craft time, which is one of my favorite activities to do. Um, we're going to show you two different crafts. And since we talked about process art and product art, I'm going to show you two crafts, um, which is the first one is the animal print craft. And that is a uh, process art. And then I'm going to show you the product art, which is mermaid tail. So let's head over. Hey guys, let's get crafting. Today we're going to do an animal print painting and this will be in place of a process art so that you'll have some type of idea. The supplies you'll need is cardboard paper, a sponge, brown and black paint, tape, and a paintbrush. Let's get started. First you're going to take your cardboard paper and you're going to take your tape and you're going to place it all over your paper to your liking. Then you're going to grab your sponge and your brown paint and you're going to paint the paper all over. Then you're going to remove your tape just like so. After you've removed your tape, you're going to grab your black paint and your paintbrush and you're going to fill in the spots where the tape was removed. And this is your end result. Now it's time for our second craft, which is in place of a product art. And this craft is a mermaid tail. You'll need cardboard paper, a mermaid tail template, scissors, a pen or pencil, glue stick, regular glue, a piece of sponge, a hole punch, and two pieces of paper. First, you're gonna take your cardboard paper and your template and trace it. Then you're gonna cut it out just like so. Take your glue, your glitter, and your sponge, and you're gonna add the glue at the bottom of the tail, and you're gonna spread it with the sponge all over. That way your glitter can go everywhere rather than in certain spots. Now that that's done, you're gonna grab a piece of paper and lay your mermaid tail on top and you're gonna sprinkle your glitter so that it won't get everywhere. Once that's done, you're gonna get your hole punch and your two pieces of colored paper and your glue stick. You're gonna fold the paper in half and you're gonna punch as many holes in it as you can. And 
and now we're gonna use our glue stick and we're gonna glue our spots on our mermaid tail. And here is the ending result. This is in place again of a product art. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed those two crafts that I showed you. Um, again, working with children, the ages are kind of up and down. You have different age groups. So you wanna try to make sure that you have different crafts and different activities that cater to all of their all of the age groups. Um, those two crafts were mostly for younger children. However, in the manual, um, they have several different crafts and activities that can be um, implemented and for all different age groups. Here, I listed about four crafts and activities that I saw that I think would be very beneficial. The very first one is um, sock animals. And I left the YouTube link so that you can go back and visit it when you have a, when you have a chance. And it's basically where you take a sock and you create whatever animal you want out of it. You add rice, um, beans, et cetera. You can improvise however you wanna make it work for you, um, but make sure you check out that link and it'll give you some insight on how to create it. Um, another one is stuffed animal sleepover, which I found it in the manual, and it is an activity for ages three to eight years old. It's on page 34 of the manual, and it is really cute. I thought it was really cute and you can actually do it different ways. It can be done virtually and it can also be done um, in person depending on if you're doing virtual or in-person programs. And it's basically the children will bring their stuffed animal and you would basically do a story time or you can do any type of activity with their stuffed animals. You can do a show and tell, um, Really, you could just be creative with it. Whatever you feel or you think works best with your age group or your um, children, your patrons, then you implement that. Um, another activity that I found in the manual on page 38 is for ages 8 plus is origami animal bookmarks. I thought this was really cute. And I actually, I already did a craft of... Um, a bookmark um, of, with origami. And I thought it was really cute. And since we're doing tails and tails, this would be really cute to create different animal bookmarks. And again, that craft is on page 38 of the manual. And like I say, you can go in and change up things as you need that will best fit your patron. And last but not least, um, which I think is a very fun, fun activity, it's Little Red Riding Hood CSI. Um, it's found on page 19 of the manual and it's between ages eight through 12. And it's your basic Little Red Riding Hood story. However, um, your patrons are to guess who is the person that killed the granny, who ate granny or who tried to eat granny or however that goes. And you can use different books. You don't necessarily have to limit yourself to Little Red Riding Hood. You can do the three little pigs, um, et cetera. Like you can just find a book and you're just basically breaking the book down and creating clues for your patrons to get. And you can actually do it like a story walk um, outside um, due to COVID. We, story walks are very beneficial and very cute and very fun and entertaining. So you can break down the story into different sections and have the patrons solve the clues in order to get to the ending results. So these are the four crafts that I thought would be really cool and would be more age appropriate depending on what ages that you're working with. Why is creative play so important? Creative play is a vital part of children, of childhood and child development. Through creative play and imaginative play, children can grow emotionally, socially, intellectually, and even physically. They'll be able to develop skills to share their thoughts, feelings, and ideas. Coming up with ways to play creatively doesn't have to be stressful or take a lot of time. In fact, 
over structuring is the opposite of creative play. Every small step towards developing a child's skill is a major milestone in their growth and happiness. And what really caught my attention was where it says overstructuring is the opposite of creative play. When children's lives have been overstructured, they seem to experience boredom for a while until they're able to regain their inner directedness. So keep that in mind when during creative play, um, when you're coming up with creative play ideas, keep that in mind. You wanna make sure that you keep them excited and having fun. Um, you don't want them to be bored. You wanna make sure that they're enjoying themselves and actually learning because when they're bored or not interested, they're not taking in any of the information that you're providing for them. Items that can be used for creative play. Sponges, paper, tape, paint, glue and adhesives, molding material, cardboard and boxes, markers, crayons, and pencils. And again, these items can be found at your house. They can also be found in your lo local library, as well as other um, libraries in your area. And I'm sure that everyone is willing to help each other. So whatever you need, if there's something that I may have, um, I will be leaving my information at the end of this slideshow. And if you need anything, contact me. And if we have it here, I will be more than happy to send anything out to you that you need. How does creative play help with emotional development? Creative play promotes emotional development and integrating feelings with tasks. As the child, ask the child to paint, draw, or tell a story about how they're feeling. These type of activities help children who are unable to verbalize their feelings a way of expressing themselves. In time, children will learn how to express their feelings safely and creatively, allowing them to integrate into social settings and regulate their behavior appropriately. How does creative play help with the child's social development? Children can grow and increase their social development when given opportunities to play and interact with peers. Singing, dancing, dress up, and other forms of imaginative play are a few areas where children can grow and develop basic communication and social interaction skills. Excuse me. How does creative play help with a child's intellectual development? Through creative play, children can learn important problem solving skills. Reading, for example, it gives children the opportunity, opportunity to express their imagination and also explore a world outside of their own, helping to improve both intellectual and cognitive skills, which are very important. This also forms the basis of reading comprehension and retention and sets the tone for solving more complex problems as they grow and develop. How does creative play help with a child's physical development? Whether your children are dancing to the rhythm of their own beat or exploring the great outdoors, creative play helps to grow growth and fine motor skills, control and coordination. Building fine motor skills requires practice and set the stage for improving hand-eye coordination and muscle memory. Providing children with creative opportunities for play will allow them to develop these important skills as well as provide them with the opportunity to explore and learn about the world around them. Here are a few book suggestions that I listed. Um, they actually go hand in hand with the extra crafts and activities that I listed earlier. Um, origami fun, jungle animals, and origami, origami birds. Those two books, I chose them because they would be very beneficial and a great book to include when you're making your origami animal book bookmarks. So those two books are really good for that. For your sleepover activity with your um, stuffed animals, I chose 
Maisie goes on a sleepover, and also Chester Raccoon and the Almost Perfect Sleepover. These will be two great books to share during the story time when you're doing the animal, the stuffed animal sleepover. And the last activity that I mentioned earlier were it was the Literary Writing Hood CSI. Um, I chose What Do You Do with a Tale Like This? Um, that book is very interesting. It gives different animal information. It gives you different clues of animals for you to guess which animal is which, which I think is very good for kids. And they're able to identify different types of animals and learn different things about different animals that they didn't know. Um, and I also chose Ninja Red Riding Hood, which is a little red riding hood with a twist. Um, and it would actually be great for the CSI game as well, because you can actually break this book apart and use it as your clues. Because kids that are a little bit older, they already know the outcome of Little Red Riding Hood. So you want to make sure that you have something that's exciting and new. And if you don't have any of these books in your system, or if you don't have the Ninja Red Riding Hood book in your system, you can always use the regular Little Red Riding Hood and just make it your own. Just create your own um, activities with it. So it'll still be fun. And like I say, with them knowing exactly what's happening with Little Red Riding Hood, it's best for you to just go in and kind of make up your own story or even allow them to make up something and maybe you can use it for that. Reminder about statistics. Please keep record of all SLP statistics. Programming passive and active for all age groups. Hours, minutes, books read in total. Incentives and certificates given. Complete all SLP reports at the end of summer reading. This is very, 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 very important because this is what is taken to the legislator to receive our funding to provide programs and services. So please keep that in mind. Final thoughts. SLP programming for children ages five through 12, it does not have to be difficult or expensive. Use what you already have and be creative. Make sure you be, make sure to be diverse and include multiple cultures, ability levels, and background so everyone feels welcome. Incorporate active and imaginative play into your library space. Have you started to plan for SLP? Thank you so much, Jessica. Now that we've heard from her, um, I'm going to give you some additional resources for the 2021 Summer Library Program. Um, this is just some extra books, some extra crafts, um, and a couple of activities that uh, may be relevant to you um, depending on your age groups that you primarily serve uh, with this particular program. So first, let's get into our additional books. Uh, first, I wanted to go over some biographies, um, which may seem uh, a little strange when it comes to the whole Tales and Tales theme, but I promise it'll make sense in a second. So first I wanna talk about Shark Lady, the true story of how Eugenie Clark became the ocean's most fearless scientist. Uh, this book is extremely cute. I love the illustrations. Um, it's for grade levels like kindergarten through third grade. It's by Jess Keating and it's illustrated by Marta Alvarez Begans. Uh, so at nine years old, Eugenie Clark developed an unexpected passion for sharks after a visit to the Battery Park Aquarium in New York City. Uh, and at the time, sharks were seen as mindless killing machines, but Eugenie knew better and she set out to prove it. Despite many obstacles in her path, Eugenie was able to study the creatures she loves so much. Um, obviously, there's a little more to this book than that, but um, I, I love this book and um, Sharks are always something that are really fascinating to kids uh, in, you know, equal awe and fear. Uh, everybody, you know, thinks Shark Week is interesting. Um, and also, you know, I, I kind of have a, a, a pet peeve about people hating on sharks, um, especially when they refer to things like shark infested waters. Um, the sharks live there, y'all. Like, we're, we're the ones infesting the waters. That's their home. The sharks 
that's where they live. Um, so I think that that this uh, particular book is good, um, not just for the theme, but you know, also for summer in general. And you know, you really can't go wrong with sharks. Uh, in that vein, we have Joan Proctor, Dragon Doctor, uh, The Woman Who Loved Reptiles. This is by Patricia Valdez and illustrated by uh, Felicita Sada. So as a girl, Joan loved reptiles. Uh, she carried a lizard with her everywhere. She even brought a crocodile to school, which I can't imagine went very well. Um, but when she got older, she became the curator of reptiles at the British Museum, and then she went on to design the reptile house at the London Zoo, and there, just like when she was a little girl, she had children's tea parties, uh, but with her Komodo dragon as the guest of honor. So this is another lady that um, really likes stereotypically dangerous animals um, and does very uh, delicate work with them, but also um, kind of uh, uh, brings a little warmth to, you know, what a lot of us view as as uh, nature's death machines. Um, and uh, this book is also very, very fun. It's very cute. As you can see, the illustrations are really cool. Um, and uh, I just, I love the art style for this. It really lends itself like to reptiles, if that makes any sense. Uh, this one is also for grades K through three. And then we have Manfish, a story of Jacques Cousteau. Uh, this is by Jennifer Byrne and it's illustrated by Eric Puybert. Um, so before Jacques Cousteau became an internationally known oceanographer and champion of the seas, he was, like many of our kids, a curious little boy. Um, this is a really great biography. It's kind of told um, less like a, a regular story biography and a little more like poetry. Um, and it has some extremely beautiful paintings in it. Um, and uh, I always thought Jacques Cousteau was cool. Um, so did my mom. So like maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm a little biased here, uh, but I think this one is fascinating. Um, and I think that this is another one the kids are really gonna like. And again, this is for grade levels K through three. Um, but these are some, some really beautifully illustrated, um, interesting to read biographies that kind of uh, pull in the human element to the Tales and Tales theme. So um, now I wanna talk about some children's series. Um, these are mostly skewed a, a little older for the, you know, like K to fifth grade spectrum. Um, and I've included all of the age groups uh, in this as well. So uh, this one is, is one of the younger ones. This is Narwhal and Jelly. Some of you I'm sure are familiar with Narwhal and Jelly uh, by Ben Clinton, but in case you aren't, uh, Narwhal is a happy-go-lucky narwhal, obviously. Uh, and Jelly is a very no-nonsense jellyfish. And the two might not have a lot in common, but they do love waffles, parties, and adventures. Um, Y'all, these are adorable. They're adorable. They're for ages six to nine-ish. Uh, and the illustrations are so fun. Um, and it's especially like if you see the one on the far right, Narwhal's Otter Friend. I just love Jelly like in the bottom left, just that kind of sad, angry frown. Um, they're, they're very, very cute. Uh, they're very enjoyable. I know when um, I was in my former library, uh, our kids loved Narwhal and Jelly. Um, and they're also, they're not like super long, so they would be um, good to incorporate for story times. Then I want to talk about the What If You Had series by Sandra Markle. Um, this this series actually started with um, what if you had animal teeth, but um, I really love some of these other covers, so I wanted to include those. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the the first one uh, on this list. What if you had animal eyes? Um, so what if you woke up one morning and your eyes weren't yours? Uh, the what if you had animal eyes book, which is um, the second in the what if you had series, and this series is through Scholastic, uh, explores what would happen if you looked in the mirror and saw a pair of animal eyes instead of your own. From the chameleon's eyes that can point in different directions, which is what she has uh, on the cover, um, to the colossal squid's eyes that shine in the dark, discover what it would be like if you had these special eyes and find out why your eyes are just the right ones for you. Um, so these books are all, you know, kind of about um, animal adaptations, which is um, which is something that you can really do like a lot of 
kind of crafts and activities around. Um, these may be a little too long to do uh, like in a, a, a kind of story time, but they'd be really good for um, book recommendation purposes. And they're typically for ages five to eight, kind of depends on their reading level. Uh, but again, these would be great books to tie in with crafts and activities. Uh, now I want to talk about Owen Davies' About Animals series. Um, this is a really like detailed nonfiction series about obviously like various creatures of the animal kingdom. Um, here we have Mad About Monkeys, Fanatical About Frogs, Crazy About Cats, and Obsessive About Octopuses. Um, there are uh, a few more books in this series so far. Um, and not only are they like really entertaining and informative, but they are beautifully illustrated. Um, I can't stop staring just like at these covers, let alone all of the content inside. They are very cool. Um, your kids are gonna really, really like these. And then um, this one's for uh, a little older. This is the Wild Witch series uh, by Lean Caberbell. Um, so, Wild Witch begins with um, Wildfire, it's the one on the far left, uh, begins with 12-year-old Clara, a small, shy, ordinary girl, until one day she meets a huge, strange black cat with glowing yellow eyes, and so begins her new life as a wild witch. Suddenly, Clara is plunged into a world of mystery and magic, but with her aunt uh, Isa to guide her, she finds she can talk to animals and walk the mysterious wild ways. and then she's captured by a chimera, and things go downhill from there. Um, these books are, uh, they're very, very interesting. They are, I mean, they're fascinating and they're, they've got really great illustrations. Um, there's this beautiful kind of fairy tale element to them, but that's still like really modern and accessible. Um, and I, I think that your kids are really going to like these. These would be a, a good, uh, kind of older, book to get some of your your older kids, um, you know, especially the ones that are kind of starting to age out of the K through fifth grade uh, sector of, you know, the summer library program and just like library programming in general and are kind of moving into middle grade. Um, I think this would be a great series for them. So then I wanted to do some additional crafts. Um, Jessica did some really, really cute uh, really like accessible, especially through virtual uh, virtual programming, some crafts and activities. Um, but I wanted to just go over a few more. Uh, then these are just some possibilities, and you can kind of you know adapt these however you need to. Um, so first, there's um, ocean slime from Steam Stational, um, which is exactly what it says on the tin. It's gooey, gooey, blue, perp uh, sparkly slime with you know starfish and stingrays and and clownfish in it. Um, kids love slime. Slime is eternal. Slime is never going to go out of style. Uh, you you really cannot go wrong with slime, um, especially sparkly slime with you know weird creatures in it. Um, then there is uh, creating a rainforest in a jar. This is like, um, this is kind of, you know, like a little terrarium. Um, really, you know, if you've got mason jars or any kind of jar will work, obviously, as long as you can see into it. Um, if you want to get fancy, you can use the mason jars. Uh, but um, these, these are both like super easy to make. And um, usually at like Dollar Tree, you can get little bags of, you know, rainforest animals or um, the sea creatures like for the ocean slime. Um, th this is, these are all materials that are very easy uh, to get and are, you know, available in a lot of different places. Um, so these things are not only good for, um, you know, like story time uh, program activities and crafts, but they'd be good like take and make programs too. Um, then we have the paper roll animals from uh, Frugal Fun for Boys. Um, everybody's got paper rolls, whether it's paper towels or toilet paper rolls. Um, you know, it just takes like some scissors, some paint, some some rolls, and you're good to go. Um, and I, as you can see, those are like extremely cute and versatile. Um, did not realize you could make quite that many things with toilet paper rolls, but there you go. Um, and then from the same place, you have pipe cleaner animals. Um, there are several like different kinds of pipe cleaner animal activities, but I really liked these because they were uh, they were really simple and I think kind of um, 
take a little bit of skill that your older kids are going to like exhibiting and your younger kids, you know, kind of need to learn in terms of like uh, motor control um, when it comes to shaping these animals. Um, but also they're like easy and fun. And then you can put googly eyes on them and everybody loves googly eyes too. Um, I'm going to send out the slides for all of these. And so those, uh, uh, the blue like links there, you can just click those on your PDF and it'll take you right to these crafts. So then we have um, the egg carton lizard from Patchwork Parent. Um, this one takes like a little bit more work, but to me it's worth it. And it would be a really, really great um, like take and make craft um, as well as like depending on how big your story time programming is, it would be a really good craft to do uh, for that. But um, it's it's a lot like simpler than it looks. Um, it's just taking, you know, like cardboard egg curtains. And um, when you cut out the, the pieces of them, you can make it into uh, a lizard that will, you know, kind of shimmy and move. Um, then you have foil fish and turtles. Um, I really love these. I linked you guys to this one because um, it's got uh, this kind of cool like texture implement to it. And if you end up getting bags of um, like the rainforest animals or the sea life creatures, a lot of times those come in like little net bags, um, which is kind of what they use like for some of this, this texturing technique in, uh, in the tinfoil animals. So you can kind of do double duty with that stuff. Um, but everybody's got tinfoil. You know, uh, I think these use watercolors. Some you can also use Sharpies. Um, and there are also crafts where uh, you could do this with like, as like mermaid tails, um, which can tie in with this as well. And then you have the animal geometric art from Tree Valley Academy. Um, the example you see like on the front page is um, something probably that your older kids are going to be a little more capable of. Your younger kids uh, probably aren't going to have like as detailed renderings, um, but the younger kids are still very capable of doing this and it gives you step-by-step -step instructions in the link there. Um, and I just thought this was very cool and it would be cool to do this. Um, again, you know, this would be a great take and make. Uh, this would also be a good um, like story time program, especially with some of your older kids. And um, you can do, you know, like kind of a, a show and tell thing. You can have them send you pictures of their um, animal geometric art that they've created, which I think would be very cool. And it would be a great like gallery display thing in the library. Um, so, you know, th this is a, also a very versatile craft. Uh, and then just a little bit of additional activities. Um, so I kind of wanted to tie in some books and activities. And um, this is one that I thought was really cool. So like, I know Jumanji is an older book, um, but Jumanji is still very cool. For those of you who, uh, for some reason, perhaps have been living under a rock and don't know what Jumanji is. Uh, it's by Chris Van Alsberg. Uh, so Judy and Peter's parents go to the opera and they leave them with instructions, uh, quote unquote, to keep the house neat. Uh, and the kids soon get really bored, obviously, uh, and they make a big mess and then they go to the park and they find this board game um, and they bring it home. And uh, it is not a run of the mill game. Uh, they roll the dice and... Uh, it's, it's a game that kind of uh, comes to you. You know, animals come out of the game. Um, there's, you know, monkeys erupting volcanoes. It's uh, uh, very much a, a real life game they have stumbled into accidentally. Um, if your kids like that, um, first of all, there's a book that they can try, especially like for your older kids, like say you want to do, you know, kind of a tie-in um, with the the movies. Um, either you want to show the uh, older movie, the Robin Williams movie, um, which still, you know, has a special place in my heart, um, or you want to show the remake, uh, Jumanji, which is the one on the right, which is also still like really cute and funny. Uh, and I believe there's a sequel already out. Um, if you want to show those, you know, when you want to do like a Jumanji tie-in, but you feel like maybe some of your kids are a little older for that, you can recommend to them The Gauntlet by Karuna Griazzi. 
Uh, so a trio of friends from New York City find themselves trapped inside a mechanical board game that they have to dismantle in order to save themselves and generations of other children. Um, it's basically kind of like a steampunk Jumanji with like a Middle Eastern flair. Um, it's for ages eight to 12. So like I said, it's kind of, it's good for your older kids who like maybe haven't graduated to the middle grade and teen programs you're offering, but need more than just like lengthy picture books. Um, so you can make this kind of a big like tie-in, you know, movie viewing activity. Um, and you could do, you know, like some animal crafts and, and that kind of stuff with that. That could be really fun. And that's something that you could do virtually, or if you're going to do like, you know, maybe a big outdoors program and you have a, a projector, you could do a lot of things with that. Um, and then I wanted to give you guys some uh, presentation resources um, for, you know, different places that you can contact that are here in Mississippi that could do, you know, programs for you. There's the Extension Service, um, the Mississippi uh, Extension Service. Um, it's uh, Mississippi State University. They do all kinds of stuff and um, they provide all these programs that they do for free. Uh, each of you is going to have like a, a local branch of the extension service, but if you find that there is a program offered that is in like a different uh, district, they will still do everything they can to make that program happen. They just may need to travel a little to do it. Um, if it's going to be in person, uh, if it's virtual, it's probably a little easier. So, you know, just contact the Mississippi State University Extension Service, see what they have on offer. Um, you really can't go wrong. It's free. It's educational. Um, then, uh, you know, we have like various zoos and aquariums here in Mississippi. There's the Jackson Zoo, the Hattiesburg Zoo. There is um, Safari Tales. There's the Institute for Marine Mammal Studies, and then there is the Mississippi Aquarium. Um, again, all of the, the blue text here are links that you guys will be able to click directly to and see for yourself. Um, but yeah, check out some of those places, especially um, since, you know, they're only like just now kind of starting to open up and they may be, you know, doing like very limited openings. They probably have some, um, you know, presentation opportunities that they may not have had time to do before um, or staff to do before. They may be able to do some virtual opportunities. And if nothing else, a lot of them have different things available like on their websites um, that are like animal related activities for kids to do from, you know, like crosswords and word finds to like, you know, printable scavenger hunts and that kind of thing. Um, you can also check out some of the wildlife organizations. Uh, if you go to the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks uh, or Wildlife Mississippi, they both have a ton of information. Um, a lot, both of them, I believe, have like different activities, you know, that you can print and include in like take and make bags. Um, and uh, they, they have all of their contact information there where you can talk to somebody maybe about, you know, doing a program for you. Um, and same with the museums. You have the Museum of Natural Science, which is attached to the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. Um, and if you haven't been to the Natural Science Museum, it is extremely cool. Um, and in that vein, there's also the Children's Museum, which is so awesome. And they do, you know, different kinds of, of uh, programs and outreach visits and stuff all the time. And they also have a whole bunch of activities on their website that you could, you know, like print and provide to your patrons um, or direct your patrons to. Um, so really those are some resources that you can definitely utilize to kind of take some of the load off of you this summer. Uh, so that's all. Uh, if you've got any questions, make sure you contact uh, Jessica or I. Jessica's information uh, is uh, jjohnson at mcls.ms. Uh, and her phone number is 601-879-8835. And then uh, my info here is kmartin-gant at mlc.lib.ms.us. And my number is 601-432-4057. If you need anything, just give either of us a call or shoot us an email. We will be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks.